Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Pratik. I'm going to be presenting on this topic of how mappers get imagery. Uh, before I start, I want to ask a few questions. Uh, first is, how many of you have mapped your home using a satellite image? Using the satellite image. Like, have you mapped your house using a satellite image? What do you feel? Like, do you feel that imagery is good? Like, are you happy with that image that you have mapped your house? Who is happy? You're happy. You're happy. Okay, nice. So, more or less, we are generally, like, unhappy. We don't feel that the imagery is good. But what is a good imagery? Uh, that is one of the questions that I get frequently asked. I work in the, uh, in the Mapbox satellite image office. Uh, Mapbox doesn't have satellite of its own. We don't even have our own planes. We don't even have a drone. But we provide images to our customers, to the people that we work in. So we are in this like very specific place where we are in the middle, where sometimes when we had to interact with the imagery providers, like Maxar, which is also called as Digital Globe previously, and we also have to interact with people who we have to provide this imagery, like organizations like Heart, which needs imagery in terms in a, in a certain situation, or to our external customer. So we we kind of like feel the pain and the benefit of both of them. We are in some way an imagery provider also, and we are some way the imagery consumer also. So as a as my day-to-day -day work, I often have to like deal with both the sides. So that's why I came up with this topic of how imagery goes to the mapper. And when a disaster actually happens, like what are the things that both the sides can do so that these things get resolved quickly. We don't have to wait for the communication for like a, a day or two days or something. We don't have to wait for the image to get to the mappers. We don't have to worry about the formats, all these things. Uh, this is my hometown. Is it? It is in the middle of India. It's a city called Bhopal, uh, and this is the image that right now we have. And I'm not very happy with that image because, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I think they told me to put on the lights because of the vi video that they are like putting on. That's why I'm really sorry. I can't control that thing. <laughs> uh, it's it's not a very interesting image, so that's why uh, it's uh, it's my hometown. It's interesting for that reason, but it's not one of the best image because I can't see really specific features. Uh, if you go zoom in somewhere in San Francisco or New York or like in the middle of a, a highly populated city in, Bur in in Europe, you will see that they have such good resolution that you can pinpoint people. I've seen also like birds getting captured in that image. And that's something that I cannot see here because I can't map the plants that my mom is growing. I, I need to like, I, I want to map all that garden, but I can't because the image doesn't let me. So this image is not good for me, but that's like my specific use case. So it really depends on what is your use case. What do you want to map? And based upon that, you can select what resource that you need. Uh, so uh, almost, Two years ago, I think Nate came up with the idea of having a group called the Imagery Coordination Group, which is to have everyone who works with satellite image into one single roof so that, uh, thank you, so that uh, in case of a disaster, we all can work together. Uh, there's no duplication of work. If Maxa is providing imagery, Mapbox doesn't have to worry about it. Or if like Planet Labs is providing imagery, Maxa doesn't have to like go through that. And all of these efforts can come in. We open that up to other folks also who could request imagery. So not only in case of disaster, where imagery gets to people quite quickly because there's a lot of like media attention to that. But in some cases, the projects are long running and they don't get a lot of media attention or they're like small enough that they can't fund or they can't buy image on their own. So in that case, they have to be requesting the image through us or through other organizations. So in those cases, it's, it's, it's valuable for those people to understand these like smaller details so that they can request imagery in a better fashion. So what makes a good imagery and what makes uh, it a good imagery request? When you are asking someone or organization about imagery, how can you make the best out of it? And how can it help them also to like get back to you and provide you the, the best option that they have? 
Uh, I want to step back and, and like talk a little bit about the whole imagery capturing platform. Uh, this is a diagram that one of my coworker made a few years ago, and it kind of like explains everything in a very basic manner. So. This side, we have satellites, which are in the atmosphere above the clouds. This line generally divides everything that is under the, the atmosphere. So you have planes, you have fast moving drones, you have quadcopter, and you can have a kite, which is like way, way lower in, the, uh, in terms of the ground. And you can see that the sharpness of the image is reducing, because these things, like a drone or aerial imagery, they are much more closer to the ground, so they have much more sharper images. You can see the features that are, that are like very smaller, like you could find a table, you can find a person, you can find all these details, but uh, as you go down, you'll see the sharpness of the images is going down, because when you're talking about satellite, the, the current resolution of the best satellites is 30 centimeter, which is good enough to identify maybe cars, but it's not good enough to identify the edge of a building that is maybe demolished. Uh, also on this axis, on the x-axis, we also have the ability of these platforms in terms of kilometer that they can capture. A satellite, because it's moving in the higher orbit, it's able to like move very fast. It's uh, able to capture a lot more area than a small quadcopter. So it depends on like your your extent of the area that you want to like uh, that you want to like work with. If you're working for a very small region, maybe a drone imagery is the best use case for you. But if you're working on a large country or a large swath or a large state, probably like satellite image is something that will be like much more better. Uh, I also like to think that this division is also making another segment here, which is how much control you have with these features. Once a satellite is launched, it's very hard to actually control it. It's in its path, so you can't like just turn it around. It's going to be going around in the same path. But, but with these features, you actually have the ability to control the plane flights. You have the ability to control where you want to like go and take your drone. Uh, there's also a factor of cost. Uh, as you want to like scale up things, like uh, drone is something that uh, is very costly when you're doing it for a very large area. You might need uh, a lot of people, you might need a lot of drones, you might need a lot of human resources, but once a satellite is launched, it actually is gap gathering f data unless there's like some mishappening that happens, like which happened with a few of the satellites. You might have heard about uh, the Worldview 4, which stopped working quite a while. So the initial investment is something that, you, that a company has to make in satellite, but over the time, it actually generates the data very frequently. Uh, some of the satellites have the ability to revolve their camera. So this is one of the case where one of Digital Globe's, aka Maxa's satellite, was able to capture San Francisco while it was in somewhere in Pacific Ocean. Uh, this gives us a little bit, a little bit of uh, ability for the satellites to capture something which is not on their path. Uh, but there still be issues. Like this is not something that is captured over the top, so it's hard to georeference it. It's hard to use it. It's hard to make it something that can be used uh, by by disaster mappers. But still, like in some cases, if your region is right next to the orbit, you can still tilt a little bit. And I think in some cases, Maxa has done that. Uh, I do feel the example is when the Kathmandu earthquake happened. They were able to like target the angle of their capture uh, towards the towards the affected area and they were able to get imagery before the the satellite was over the top of the city so in some cases it can happen but still like it's it's a difficult thing it it depends on the satellite itself uh, and in general space is hard you know the launching a satellite is a big massive process it takes time it takes a lot of money and even after like launching it, there could be issues with with capturing the data. Uh, at, a, at any given point, 
in time, there's one third of the world which is already covered with clouds. So you have very really less probability of actually capturing a specific place that you need. So that's why when we ask someone about like, hey, can I get an imagery of this place at this time? It's actually based on luck. There might be clouds over that specific location. So you might not get the exact feature that you want to visualize in your map because space is hard. Uh, yeah, and clouds, of course, are one of the one of the biggest problem that all the satellite companies face. So that's that's kind of like the limitation. Uh, drone images, of course, are are very better in terms of that. They don't have to worry about uh, the, the the clouds. They don't have to worry about all these other factors that the satellite has to face. Uh, but there's a limit also to drone imageries. Like we cannot have drone images for all over the world. There has to be someone who has to fly these drones. Uh, it also depends on like how much that person is capable of doing that. It's a, it's a little bit of manual work. Uh, and there are often times when you will see that that there are some factors in georeferencing those images that could create a little bit of offset in that image. So there's there's those factors. Uh, in the middle is something that I really like, which is aerial imagery, which is definitely something that's commercially out there. Uh, this is a White House where you can identify the sprinklers. So in terms of sharpness, these images are really good. And the planes are much more better, and they cover a lot more area than any drone. So it's kind of like a very like in the middle sweet spot where it's able to capture a lot more area and at a lot more better resolution. Uh, some of the imagery companies actually work a lot with insurance and they are able to go out and fly and capture the parts of the country which are affected by uh, any kind of disaster. But then Again, the problem comes with like the the scalability of these things in every country. Not every country has a good established aerial imagery industry. So you will see that there's a lot more aerial imagery providers in U.S., in Australia, in 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 New Zealand, uh, in Europe. But you won't find good imagery sources somewhere in the middle of Africa or even in India because there are like some commercial constraints there. So it's kind of like in a sweet spot. So that's like the general overview of these images. Uh, but what I want to like emphasize is like identifying what is your use case? What is the thing that you want to use this imagery for? Are you planning to map the boundary of a dam? Because that can be captured in 10 cent, 10 meter also. Like you could use Landsat imagery to actually find the the boundary of of a of a dam. But what if your use case is very niche? What is your if if your use case is identifying a specific tree, a specific tree type? I think then you need to go deeper, and then you need to find out that oh, I need specifically aerial imagery, or I need specifically uh, drone imagery to identify feature, and that gives. I think it's the first step to identify for the imagery provider to say yes or no, that yes, we can provide you this thing, or no, we can't provide you this, this thing. Also, at this point, you can also identify whether you have to go for a commercial data set, or you can actually use an open data set. There are some really good uh, options available in AWS, uh, Open Data Program, where they have all the Landsat archive. Uh, Sentinel data is also available, so maybe your use case could be easily fulfilled by just open data, and you don't have to worry about going to a major provider and finding a uh, finding a source of funding. Uh, be very specific about the area. Uh, a few of the requests when it came to us, like they were like, "Hey, can we have good imagery for this country?" Now, a country is really big, and recent imagery or good imagery is a very vague term. So be very specific. If you could draw a GeoJSON or you, if you could make a, a shape file of the very specific area that you are interested in, that's very helpful because it gives us uh, a specific starting point to see what are the sources available in that specific region. It also, it like all the imagery, uh, industry works in terms of square kilometers, so it's also easy for them to identify and say that, oh, we are able to give
give you 10,000 square kilometer of image. So that is very useful for image providers. So whenever you are asking for image, be very specific. Ask them about like, hey, can we have 10,000 square kilometer of image around this polygon or like this specific region? Give them that. If possible, give them a priority area also. Like give them two options. Give them like, hey, this is like the overall area that we are interested in. But if you could provide us these specific cities, it will be very useful for us. So that could be like a very good starting point. Be specific about dates. Say that you want the image of 2017 within these months. That really helps. Uh, if you can't give a longer range, be like, can we have summer imagery of 2018 or something like that? Be specific about dates. Also, one of the things that I've often struggled here is when you are sharing someone a shape file about a region, there might be issues with uh, the georeferencing of that shape file. So often don't try to like upload that. Use some other services which host GeoJSONs or shape files or any kind of area files on the web so that they can easily visualize it rather than worrying about downloading it and converting that because you can have you can have like a specific shape file that's working on your system, but the other person is not able to view it. So that's something that I've also struggled with. Uh, there's, there's a website called geojson.io, and I'm going to link it up in a, in the, uh, in a resource uh, link, and I'm going to tweet about this after the talk, and there's also going to be a link towards the last. But use that kind of service. Uh, GitHub also is has the ability to render images on their uh, on their gist, so you can use that also. Uh, they are much more better resources to just send someone a shape file rather than actually sending them a bunch of like files over uh, over like an email. So you can use that. Uh, also decide on the delivery of like how you are going to get this imagery. Uh, sometimes people share that with Google Drive, some, but sometimes with Dropbox. Uh, these, are, these are all great for smaller portion of imagery, for one single file, for two single, for two or three files. But when we are talking about a large area, like the whole of, of maybe a city, then you might need quite a lot of space. Uh, I would suggest use something like AWS, where people have the capability of downloading things in bulk or there could be a programmatic access of those images because when you're working with them you don't want someone to spend like half of their day downloading by clicking one link or another uh, there's also a good thing like uh, there's also a good resource uh, by one of our uh, one of our co-worker Vincent who works in DevSeed about COGS which is cl uh, cloud optimized GIF where the image format is much more suited for clouds and you can do a lot more things without actually downloading the image so your, all your data stays in S3, but you're still able to get the extent of the data or a preview or things like that. So it's like much more better way of hosting imagery. Uh, be specific about the format. There's a lot of formats available and there could be chances that you will receive something which is in a very weird format. Uh, I can give you an example. There's this one property uh, format called MRZ, which is great because it bundles up a lot of pixels in one single file. But the problem is not everyone has the ability to like unlock it and to actually uh, process it. So make sure that you agree with your provider in terms of the data format and the delivery mechanism. And actually, very close to that is the aesthetics of the image. Uh, a lot of the time, images are captured in a specific time of the day. So there could be possibility that there are big shadows. There could be possibility that there are atmospheric effects on the image. It could be hazy. It could have feet. It, it could have a lot of brightness. And you have the ability right now in ID and in other in other softwares where you can actually edit the image and make it much more better looking. Uh, these are small tweaks that goes a long way because if you are trying to identify roads or like buildings, doing small changes in the imagery aesthetics can make them much more visible for the mappers so that someone who can map 100 buildings can maybe map like 200 or like 120 buildings actually. And that's actually when it like you pile that up with a lot of people who are working on that same project, it actually works up. I'm going to show you a small example of how that can be done in ID.
So this is ID and uh, in the in the side panel of the background images, if you select any one of the images as go down, you can see there are display options. And you can tweak a small details and actually make some of the things pop up much more better. This is something that has been pushed out recently, and I don't think it has been publicized that much, but this is such a great feature to have where you don't have to worry about editing the image. You can do it on your browser. So you can just tell your mappers that, hey, if you tweak a few of the things, maybe the features are much more brighter and you'll be able to identify them much more cleaner. And this is the link that you can follow for all the things that I've talked about. Uh, I initially wanted to make this a panel uh, kind of talk where I talk with all of you about like what are the situations that you have faced with imagery, and we can have answers from like the crowd itself and, and me, but I've changed it the last time to start with a few of the basics and then go into the talk. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions, like what, what do you feel is something that you require in terms of imagery? Uh, have you had any experience working with someone where you wanted to get a good imagery for a specific area and you were not able to get that? Maybe, maybe we can work around and maybe we can find out how we can make this process much more better between all of us. So, that's it, yeah, I'm gonna open it up for questions. So yeah, feel free to start. Well, when I have a map at home, I often have the question, mm -hmm. of what year are these images? And it's often very difficult to estimate that usually they are two years old or maybe more or less. Is there a way to find out? And another thing is, is there a way to, to Print or put it on the screen the year of the of the image you use. That's a that's a good question. Um, so some of the imagery providers are very specific about their dates. You could find individual scenes, and you could find that this scene is five years old, this scene is two years old. They even have the capture, exact capture dates. Unfortunately, in a few cases. Uh, when we purchase imagery, we don't purchase individual scenes. We purchase a large area, and that's like much more better for many of the companies. When you're buying imagery, you don't want to buy like smaller scenes. You want to buy the entire Africa. You want to buy the entire US. Uh, it's a much more better deal. And when that happens, like you are actually buying a product which is a mosaic, which is essentially uh, a pipeline that has ingested quite a lot of images over the year, and they have kind of like blended ended them up so that you don't see the edges, the hard edges. And that makes it difficult. They are using a big range of two years of imagery to process them into one single product. In some cases, it is available. Bing is really good at that. If you, I think if you right click at the Bing API and see the, see the tile information metadata, they do have information about many of their, most of their tiles. Uh, Mapbox doesn't provide that because we don't have that information from our service provider. In some cases we do, but we are not able to get that on our API. So in some cases it is available. Bing, of course, is an example. I don't know if Mexa provides that in terms of uh, in terms of their imagery layer. But yeah, the problem is like when you're mosaicing a ton of imagery, it just gets very difficult to answer that into very specific days. Especially when you have you can choose between Maxer images or Bing image or Esri image. Sometimes one is better uh, regarding resolution and brightness and things like that, but it's worse because it's older. That's, that's and true. That making that decision is rather difficult. It is. It is. It is one of the decisions that I have to like make also like quite a lot of time when I'm actually working with some of the providers and I have to choose and I don't have that information. It makes it difficult. But I think. Over the time, we'll be able to like eradicate some of them, uh, but that is a genuine question, and I think a few emoji providers are much more better. Bing, of course, is like it's ha it, it sets up a industry benchmark of providing like all the information as much as possible. I think we can do a few work in the future years, so maybe in the future years you will see Mapbox providing imagery dates, uh, but still like work in progress. And yeah, like when we are going back from the mosaic to individual, then it will be much more easier to do that. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Hello. I am speaking into the microphone. But... 
Yeah, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, so I'm, I'm Luke uh, from IFRC. Um, I've got five questions. Sure. But rather than bore everyone with those, um, I'll, uh, it's basically I'm going to talk about um, experience in uh, Mozambique six months ago, um, responding to the cyclone Idai, and a couple of questions I'll be able to capture in this. So one, we did some severity estimation by basically flying around and using a simple Kobo form, but that seems ridiculous that we're still doing that, and we should be doing this much better either through aerial assessments, I, I agree that it should be, rather than uh, satellite imagery, we should be using aerial assessment, but what is the system? We don't have a system, I think. don't think, but maybe you can suggest what role Mapbox or others could play. In getting that aerial imagery, having it into the cloud so it can be tagged, not just for damage and non-damage, but by larger area, potentially we could have a severity estimation. So you have multiple people validating that same estimation, then maybe you have something that's a useful product. Um, so I'm wondering whether that's that's possible with your role as a, is what I understand to be a broker mm -hmm. um, of imagery. And then the second kind of related question will be aerial assessment, it's expensive, you only get it for the big emergencies that you can afford it. Um, what are the potential uh, advancements that are coming with nano satellites, which I didn't see in your slide, so I'm wondering when that will happen and what should we expect? So first question first, I think, uh, so we have a image processing pipeline, we call it Pixel Monster, and that's able to like process a ton of imagery in like very small time. Uh, there's another thing that we have, which is our upload API, where you can upload your smaller images actually and in your own account. So you don't have to worry about us. You can actually just use Mapbox Studio or we have some CLI tools or our SDK to actually upload things on your own account. And there is a little bit of limit on the size of it, but if you are working with a, a disaster response work or you're working with community, you can actually like, uh, ask Mikhail and his his team is is the one that takes responsibility of all these things and they can bump up your storage cost so you'll still be able to like access all those images and you'll have a much more bigger cost but if you are doing it on a very large scale then you can actually talk to us and we can we can tell you the ways with which we process images for our own like pipeline. So for bulk, you can reach out to me. If you have very small specific images that you want to upload, you can talk to Mikkel. And yeah, like the size, I, I think in general, uh, when I say large amount of image, I'm talking about terabytes of image. Yeah. Uh, so the area that we covered for Mozambique was twice the size of Wales. Um, I'm from the UK and mm -hmm. Wales is a legitimate area, a uh, unit of measurement in the UK. Um, but yeah, so it's also, I think, uh, about the same size as the Serengeti. Okay. Something like can, that. I, anyway, can, so I the, can I ask about the resolution of like what image you're trying S to upload? So we basically flew around in helicopters okay. and used uh, a Kobo form okay. and took images. Okay. Very basic, very rudimentary. What I would love is that so we have these uh, helicopters that come to an emergency that we have something which we can attach to the underside of the uh, helicopter and that we're taking that imagery. But those images are geo-rectified? Um, the ones that we were taking? No. Well, they had, yeah, they're not geo-rectified, but they had um, geolocation. Okay. So they had, you know, GPS in yeah, but basic so, answer. So that's, that's a little bit different other than the geo-referencing of the image. So if you have a coordinate of yourself taking the image, that won't help because the image also needs a geo-rectification. So if the image has that, then of course we can upload it. But if the image doesn't have that transformation of how it actually interacts with the land, then it's not a, a imagery that can be used to in these cases. So I might be able to answer that if I see that image. So let's talk like after the after the this chat and. Uh, what was your second question? I missed out that. What's coming next? So oh. now satellites that kind of thing. Oh, so uh, I feel the work that Planet Lab is doing is pretty interesting. They have quite a lot of satellites, smaller satellites, but they are able to do a lot more passes of the whole world. So what you see is like right now they have almost a daily overview of the world. They're capturing every place in the world every day. And what it does, it like it gives you a better like change 
that's happening in places and the resolution is also not bad it's actually i think it's like five meter which is more than good enough to identify a lot of things that 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 change a lot uh, so i think as time changes these satellites will be able to like shrink down their resolution and we'll be able to have a much more like daily overview of the world which is as comparable to like the current commercial satellite so maybe in the next like few years we'll be able to see uh, these stacks of multiple satellites capturing everything every day and once we have these data maybe like we can correlate that and improve the upcoming satellites like we'll be able to like you know do some kind of statistic work and for every pixel we'll be able to identify much more better uh, maybe like the color maybe the resolution so that's i think that that's that's the interesting part that 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 will change a lot of the effort that this coordination group was working with i think someone has question from this side ah. i have more questions sure go ahead do you have a question jacobo um, so my question is on the uh, coordination. So there's a number of you know, disaster charter was set up what 15 years ago, uh, something like that, and it was useful at that point. Now we have Copernicus, which is the European version of that. We have other efforts where like uh, commercial imagery providers will make their uh, imagery available, but the coordination is still very tricky. There is a there is a UN uh, web portal where you can more or less see but um but because they're each of the you know what imagery has already been acquired for which areas mm -hmm. but because of the, all of the systems are different the way that they process the imagery is different and the output is different it means that you can't get that overview i mean I'm, it's kind of the same question but in a different format for the aerial assessment we just wanted a quick overview of severity across a really big area mm -hmm. And that's what still sa satellite imagery is not providing us. It's providing very detailed like damage assessments for houses, which are often val no, va sometimes validated. Sometimes it gives a false impression. So people have lost a bit of trust in those things. But it's not giving you what I think the real value could be is that initial estimation of priority areas based on severity. Um, and so that's... Like I wonder what your coordination, you talked about a coordination platform, what does that do to address that problem, please? So I think that was like focused on very specifically about heart. Uh, so every time a, a new task will come up, a new activation come up, I think there was a, a lot of conversation which were happening on the emails between people, but it was hard to keep a track on. I remember, I think, Two years ago, when uh, when there was one of the event and Nate was trying to email us as well as they were trying to like coordinate things with Digital Globe, and we buy the same imagery from Digital Globe. So it was like both of us were working on the same thing. So I think the idea was that all of these things which were under the under the hot umbrella could be focused on one single could be like talked around in one single place so that each one of us know and there's no duplication of work and we could save our resources for maybe some place where hot where digital globe cannot happen uh, cannot help or, or vice, vice versa i think that was the initial like idea that nate had uh, i think all these coordination groups rely a lot on how frequently they get used and a lot of the time when bigger disaster like happened digital globe has been like really amazing at putting imagery in the front of the of the of in their in their open data program and just like keep it out but mostly the smaller programs didn't get to like you know get imagery like especially which are like long term programs or which didn't have a lot of visibility or they were like initially in the in the in the in the first stages so I think it's that that group did it worked in the initial phase, but it now is like the responsibility of all of us to take that to a next step. Like how, if we talk more in that group, if we like ask more about what are the options available, I think that will also attract other people who could help. Like right now there could be some other, there's like now every country have their own satellite imagery provider. So maybe like they could also be part of that group. Maybe when something happens in India, like we don't have to worry about Digital Globe or Mapbox, maybe ISRO can come in and provide their own imagery. So I think it's more, the more we talk in that group, the more we talk about that group, the more we talk that, 
hey, like let's work together so you don't have to worry about when 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 these disaster happen. Maybe that that is like the next. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not able to exactly give you the right answer because there is no right answer in that topic. But I think the more conversation we have about this, the more better it will be. Actually, is it working? It's working. I think they just recorded oh, okay, for okay. the streaming service. So yeah, actually, a, a bit in in the same direction. So say, um, so then maybe to have this kind of large area overview, the piece that is missing is there is a disaster. Several providers are activated, several satellite, provide, image provide, satellite image providers are activated and they release what they have, mm -hmm. piles uh, in different pieces of the area affected. Mm -hmm. So maybe the piece that is missing is how do we glue this together to provide immediately one best mosaic. You talked about before a mosaic, right? Mm -hmm. So the way you, you provide the image of the whole Africa, you take different uh, pieces, you glue it together mm -hmm. according to some algorithm that uh, you know, glues where it's needed because everything is geolocated, and then you provide just one thing. Yeah. So I think. So why can't can't we do it? So right now it's actually it's it's doable in a few sense. So I think uh, in the tasking manager you have the options of adding your own custom layer. So whenever you 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 add that you you start working on the tasking manager, the first image that appear is what you set on this. And I think currently the, even the ID editor is such that like five different layers of Bing, Mapbox, two of the Maxar, and I think a few of the Isri images, they are all available in one single editor. I think it's like like how Hot has able to make a tasking manager where like multiple people are able to like work. I think this image coordination and this like work and like this, this, these chats about all this will also help us identify a way with which we can plug those images. Uh, open aerial imagery is one of the is one of the project that I think Nate is working on, which is also some place where people can host their own imagery. Uh, I think there's also ways with which you can actually tile and like connect multiple TMS layers together. So maybe like this is like more of a technical challenge that like the the tasking manager like building development team will have to like worry about where you have like a big region and one company is able to provide a smaller section and the other company is able to provide the other smaller section, how do you input those information in those tasking manager blocks so that when Mappers opens up an image, open up a block, like he gets the right image for that task. So I think it's a little bit of the technical task that has to be done on the tasking manager. But right now we have the ability to like, you know, layer upon multiple images. Jossum has the ability, ID has the ability. It's just the fact that we have to club that into tasking manager. Uh, so maybe we can have a conversation with some of the people who actually like develop task manager. Uh, does that answer your question? Thank you. Sorry, me again. Go ahead. Um, so um, yeah, building on that. So again, back to Mo Mozambique. Multiple drone now big emergency. Like you have multiple people turning up with drones, but there's no coordination at all. They go out, they use the drones terrible ethics, terrible practice, but and they use it for whatever they use it for, but nobody else gets to find out about that. Um, so what, you know, my advice at the time, I didn't have time to really get involved in it too much, was to say, upload your imagery to Opal, Open Aerial um, uh, Map. Open Aerial Map? Um, open Aerial Map. Um, but it, that, is that the right workflow for getting that then to be used for that emergency response? Because is, is that connected to the tasking manager? Is that, does that then get served so that it can be part of the prioritized areas for imagery, uh, for digitization? So I think you do, when you upload things, upload imagery on open aerial map, you actually can generate a TMS layer, which you can import to the tasking manager. So there is a way, I think the missing point is that when you have multiple different sources, how do you add those information to each of the specific block of a tasking manager? I think that is missing. And that's still like doable, but it's a little bit manual. Like someone who's creating the task has to go and edit that thing, or maybe like add that in the information or the, the instruction side that, hey, if you're working on block one to 10, use this layer. If you're working for on block like 10 to 15, use this layer. So I think those are the manual steps that still someone has to take, either the mapper 
or the one who's like creating the task or like maybe something that maybe tasking manager developers will integrate but it's still possible it's just that it's a little bit manual work and i think those are the smaller things that we can improve to like make it very seamless have you heard of the last one? So uh, MapSwipe might be able to help with prioritization of areas because you can have multiple users verifying what they see in an image. So if you're, if you're grading on like a level of severity of change, you could have multiple people confirm like what's a high versus a medium versus a low level and actually have grids generated based on that verification that you could then use to prioritize a tasking manager project. So that's one. Um, the only issue I find with grids having all the different imagery is the offsets pertaining to each set of imagery could be significant and that would need to be looked into probably prior to making that project um, but like he said you you currently can take uh, a host like a, a tiled map service provided by open aerial map and use that as a custom layer in the tm so that's like ready to go right now yeah Okay, hi. I, I would like to talk to you about it from the, the mapping and validator side. <clears throat> um, uh, they're talking about drone imagery and things like that and bringing it in to be used um, uh, by the mappers, um, that sort of thing. Um, our problem is that the drone imagery that comes in is not compatible with the imagery we already have. There are scale differences. It's never been author corrected. It's very difficult to actually get the scales to, to match up. So uh, what, what we have done in, in specialist workshops with advanced mappers is only use those as visual guides to confirm what is or isn't on the imagery that we're looking at. So we wouldn't actually download it and actually map from that imagery. Um, we would use it as a guide rather than um, a backdrop. Uh, just as an idea of um, how difficult it is, to use sporadic um, uh, drone um, imagery to do what we're doing. That's, a, that's a one of the great points, because I think I'm going to go back again saying that aerial image is better in that case, because it's done by someone commercial, and the amount of uh, hardware complexity and like the QA process that they have is a little bit higher than what drones can do. So in that way, they actually are much more better in terms of accuracy uh, than some of the individual drone co providers. So in that way, if aerial imagery providers can do maybe in the future these flights over the, the area that needs them, I think they, they'll be a much more better option than, than maybe the drones. Uh, I'll be I'll be there in the Mapbox pod, and if you want to like talk about anything related to Imagey, please feel free to come. Uh, you can also check out Mapbox community page if you have any doubt about like how we can work together. Uh, and thank you, thank you for coming.